Welcome to the new class and today we will discuss about uveitis. So before discussing uveitis, first we briefly revise the anatomy of uveal tract. Uvea or uveal tract is the middle pigmented vascular layer of the eyeball. If you recall, the eyeball has three layers. This is the external layer. It consists of cornea anteriorly and sclera posteriorly. And then comes the middle layer, which, which is the vascular layer of the eyeball. It consists of three parts, iris, ciliary body and choroid. So this is called uveal tract or we called it uvea. So it is not a single structure like cornea or sclera or lens. It consists of three continuous but distinct structures that are iris which is continuous with the ciliary body and then posteriorly is the choroid. Now the iris. Iris is the most anterior part of the uveal tract. It consists of muscles, nerves, blood vessels and the pigmented cells called melanocytes. These melanocytes are actually responsible for giving color to our eyes. And this iris has a hole in the center which is called pupil and its size is regulated by two important muscles of the iris called sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. This inside one is the sphincter pupillae and this outer is the dilator pupillae. This is sphincter pupillae, it constricts or reduces the size of pupil. It is supplied by the parasympathetic nerves through short ciliary nerves that ultimately comes from the third cranial nerve. And this outer one is the dilator pupillae which dilates the pupil and it has a sympathetic nerve supply. Uh, it's, it is supplied by long ciliary nerves, which are the branches of ophthalmic division of the fifth cranial nerve. So the pupil controls the amount of light entering into the eye in night time or when there is a dim light, the pupil dilates. So it allows more lights to enter into the eye. While in bright light, this aperture gets constricted and that's, uh, so it restricts the excessive amount of light entering into the eye that might be damaging to our retina. The second part of the uveal tract is the ciliary body. Ciliary body extends from the root of iris anteriorly to the ora serrata posteriorly. Ora serrata is the terminal part of the sensory retina. So the sensory retina extends anteriorly till ora serrata and the ciliary body terminates posteriorly at that point and it continues posteriorly as choroid. Anatomically, ciliary body is divided in two parts. Anterior part, which is thick and folded, is called pars plicata. You see, this part has folds. It has these projections or plications. So that's why it is called pars plicata. Posterior part is thin and plane. It is called pars plana. Here are the zonular fibers. These zonular fibers are attached to the pars plicata here with the ciliary body and uh, on the other side they are attached to the lens. So they hold the lens in its place. And the ciliary body, especially this pars plicata, has three main parts. Here is the ciliary muscles then ciliary stroma and then the ciliary epithelium. These are functionally, these parts are important parts of the ciliary body. The ciliary muscles, when they, these muscles contract, they relax the zonules and the, this lens changes its shape. It becomes more spherical and more convex and its refractive power is increased. And uh, the ciliary muscles also have parasympathetic nerve supply. So during accommodation, there is a stimulation of parasympathetic nerves, which contracts the ciliary muscles and relaxes the zonular fibers. And the lens becomes more spherical and its refractive power is increased. 
which is required for the accommodation and simultaneously the pupil also const constricts because this constrictor pupillae or uh, sphincter pupillae also contracts in response to the parasympathetic supply. So in accommodation, the lens becomes more spherical and pupil gets constricted. Then here is the ciliary stroma. Ciliary stroma is highly vascular structure and it regulates the amount of aqueous production. And here inside is the ciliary epithelium, which is the non-pigmented epithelium. And it is actually responsible for secretion of aqueous humor in the posterior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. Then the posterior part is the pars plana, which is posterior, uh, posterior four millimeter, and it secretes mucopolysaccharides. Uh, these mucopolysaccharides are the main component of the vitreous, vitreous uh, fluid. Then the choroid. Choroid is the most posterior part of the uveal tract. It is highly vascular and pigmented layer lies between the retina inside is the retina and outside is the sclera so it is in between the retina and the sclera this red part is the choroid it is highly vascular structure it extends anteriorly from scleral spur to pos posteriorly till the optic nerve and it provides nutrition to the outer layers of the retina and it also removes the waste products from the outer layers of the retina. Now coming back to uveitis. Uveitis means inflammation of the uveal tract. It can involve any part of the uvea or sometimes it can involve the whole uveal tract simultaneously. So it is classified anatomically into anterior uveitis which includes aritis which is, that is the inflammation of iris and the cyclitis which is the inflammation of the anterior part of ciliary body and combinedly they are called aridocyclitis. Intermediate uveitis is the inflammation of the posterior part of the ciliary body which is called pars plana so it is called pars planitis and then is the posterior uveitis which is the inflammation of choroid it is called choroiditis and as the retina is very closely related to the choroid, so sometimes when there is an inflammation of choroid, the adjacent retina also gets inflamed. So it is called chorioretinitis. Then comes the panuveitis. Panuveitis means inflammation of whole uveal tract simultaneously. All the parts of the uvea are involved. So it is called panuveitis. Uveitis can also be classified according to the duration of the disease. Acute uveitis means when the signs and symptoms subsides before six weeks of duration, it is called acute. When signs and symptoms persist longer than six weeks period, then it is called chronic uveitis. So the anterior uveitis affects the parts of anterior uvea, that is the iris and the anterior portion of the ciliary body. So it is either aritis or it is aridocyclitis. And mostly it is idiopathic. Idiopathic means when the cause of the disease is unknown. We don't know what is actually stimulating or causing the disease process. So most of the cases of anterior uveitis are idiopathic. But sometimes they can be caused by trauma or there is any systemic infection or inflammatory disease which is associated with the anterior uveitis. And usually it occurs as a single episode and it subsides with the proper treatment. But sometimes anterior uveitis persists for the longer period of time and it causes visual threatening complications. Anterior uveitis is the most common form of all uveitis which accounts for about two-third cases of all the cases of uveitis. Intermediate uveitis is the inflammation of the pars plana, that is the posterior portion of the ciliary body, and its adjacent vitreous. It is uh, known as pars planitis. It is also most commonly it is idiopathic, but it can also be associated with 
systemic infections or inflammatory diseases. Posterior uveitis in its true sense is the inflammation of choroid that is choroiditis because retina is not a part of the uveal tract but as it is closely attached to the choroid so sometimes it is inflamed when there is a inflammation of choroid and also the inflammatory process is seen in the posterior vitreous it is called vitreitis which is secondary to choroiditis or retinitis or combinedly chorioretinitis and the pan uveitis pan uveitis means inflammation of the all parts of the uveal tract as we have discussed that anterior uveitis is the most common type of uveitis which accounts for about 2/3 of all the uveitis cases and most of the cases of anterior uveitis are idiopathic but sometimes the uveitis can be associated with systemic diseases which are either inflammatory or infectious among the common infections of anterior uveitis are tuberculosis and syphilis and in fact the tb and syphilis can be the cause of any type of uveitis either anterior intermediate posterior or in pan uveitis and herpes simplex and herpes zoster viral infections can also cause anterior uveitis inflammatory diseases which can be associated with anterior uveitis are the seronegative spondyloarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis psoriatic arthritis and the reiter syndrome also there is the association of inflammatory bowel diseases and the chronic anterior uveitis in children can be seen in the in association with juvenile idiopathic arthritis intermediate uveitis can also be most commonly idiopathic but infections like tuberculosis syphilis and lyme's disease could also be seen in association with intermediate uveitis inflammatory or autoimmune causes of intermediate uveitis includes sarcoidosis and multiple sclerosis then posterior uveitis again can be idiopathic but infections like tuberculosis syphilis herpes viruses and uh, toxoplasmosis and toxocariasis toxoplasmosis and to toxocariasis are relatively common infectious causes of posterior uveitis and pan uveitis inflammatory causes include sarcoidosis collagen vascular diseases like sle rheumatoid arthritis and polyarthritis nodosa can be the causes and then there is a basset's disease and vkh then the pan uveitis which can be idiopathic it can also be associated with infections like tuberculosis syphilis cytomegalovirus retinitis toxoplasmosis and toxocariasis and the inflammatory causes include sarcoidosis sympathetic ophthalmia basset's disease and the vkh it is difficult to discuss the details of each and every associated disease but we will quickly go through some important associated diseases especially those which are associated with anterior uveitis because it is the most common type among all the uveitic cases so number 1 is the ankylosing spondylitis ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammatory disease that over time can cause fusion of the vertebrae in the spine so the vertebrae gets fused together and it makes the spine less flexible and it can result in hunched forward posture it is common in the young males symptoms typically begins in the early adulthood it presents with the low back uh, pain and stiffness the cause of ankylosing spondylitis is unknown but genetic factors seems to be involved in particular 
people who have a gene called human leukocyte antigen B27 or we can call HLA B27 are at greatly increased risk of developing ankylosing spondylitis. And for the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, we advise the X-ray of spine, especially the sacroiliac joints. And this X-ray spine shows the bamboo spine, this non-flexible bamboo spine. And anterior, acute anterior uveitis is seen in 40% of cases of ankylosing spondylitis. Second one is the psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis is a form of arthritis that affects some people who have chronic psoriasis. Usually the inflammation occurs in the distal phalangeal joints and patients can present with the swelling fingers and toes and uh, there is a deformities in hands and feet. There is a foot pain which is secondary to inflammation of foot tendons and ligaments and patient can have low back pain because of spondylitis that is inflammation of joints between the vertebrae of the spine and patient can also have sacroiliitis which is the inflammation of uh, joints between the spine and the pelvis so 25% of patients having psoriatic arthritis can develop anterior uveitis then the inflammatory bowel diseases, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can have associated anterior uveitis, especially those patients who are positive with HLA B27. Then is the juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Formerly it was called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and it is the most common type of arthritis seen in children under 16 years of age. It causes persistent joint pain, swelling and stiffness of the joints. It has different types uh, like uh, polyarticular when uh, more than four joints are involved. It is called polyarticular and then is the group called posyarticular where the inflammation occurs in fewer than four joints. And uveitis is most uh, frequently seen in this posse articular group, especially in the female patients. The rheumatoid arthritis factor is usually negative and uh, antinuclear antibodies are mostly positive in those who have associated anterior uveitis. And uh, this uveitis are usually chronic in nature, eye is usually white and child is mostly asymptomatic and it, if it is not checked routinely it may end up with the complications like band keratopathy, cataract and glaucoma or even the blindness. Then the sympathetic ophthalmia. It is relatively new term. It is a very rare but an interesting cause of granulomatous pan uveitis. It occurs as a result of ocular surgery or more commonly penetrating trauma to one eye with any sharp object like knife, needle or pen or pencil etc. And especially when there is a prolapse of uveal tissue. And after a certain period of time, and the time is actually not specified, we can say that it ranges from one week to as many as um, uh, many years like uh, we can say that as long as 30 years, uh, the, in, uh, the disease process, the span uveitis starts in the normal eye. It, uh, the normal eye starts developing uveitis and which ultimately involve the whole uveal tract. That uh, it is, it, it develops severe granulomatous pan uveitis and it occurs as a sympathy of other eye which got trauma. That is why it is named as sympathetic ophthalmitis. The cause is exactly unknown, but there is an autoimmune response towards the ocular antigens. And there is a hypersensitivity, delayed hypersensitivity reaction to melanin containing structures. It is characterized by granulomatous mutton fat capes. See, these are the large capes which are granulomatous and these are called 
mutton fat kps and uh, iris there is also a thickening of iris and uh, patient soon develops vitritis and uh, can have this exudative retinal detachment now what are the clinical features of uveitis signs and symptoms depends upon the site of uveal involvement in anterior uveitis patient may complain of pain or um, discomfort watering photophobia and there may be mild to moderate blurring of vision in chronic uveitis sometimes patient is asymptomatic or unless he may develop some complication of uveitis like cataract or band keratopathy so may uh, he may complain of blurring of vision according to the severity of complication in intermediate and posterior uveitis patient complains of floaters which are secondary to vitreous opacities and there uh, may be complain of significant decreased vision because uh, of the simultaneous involvement of retina or associated macular edema then the signs patients with anterior uveitis can present with the red eye and the redness is more marked in the area surrounding the limbus it is called circumcorneal congestion or ciliary congestion because this is the site of ciliary body um, the ciliary body is present beneath the sclera in the area surrounding the limbus cornea shows inflammatory cells and um, uh, uh, these cells are deposited on the corneal endothelium these cells this these are called keratinocytic precipitates or we call them kps so cornea shows kps the anterior chamber shows inflammatory reaction in the form of cells and flare and visual acuity uh, may or may not be reduced and uh, pupil is myosed irregular because of the posterior synecies hypopion may be present and in chronic cases cornea may show band keratopathy it is a deposition of calcium in the cornea in the shape of strip or band in next slide i will show you in uh, pictures the uh, of these all signs uh, of the uh, uveitis in intermediate uveitis the, there are inflammatory cells and opacities in the anterior vitreous and these opacities are called snowballs and there may be cystoid macular edema or peripheral retinal vasculitis and in posterior uveitis also shows the signs of vitreitis and patches of choroiditis and optic nerve head swelling and cystoid macular edema and retinal uh, retinitis and retinal vasculitis here are uh, some signs of uveitis this is circumcorneal congestion this is the area exactly where the ciliary body is present beneath the sclera and because of the inflammation of ciliary body the vessels here are congested and engorged and uh, this uh, circumcorneal or circumciliary congestion is typical of uveitis and this is the inflammatory hypopion it is uh, exudation in the anterior chamber secondary to the inflammation of anterior uvea these are the keratinocytic precipitates and they are the they are the inflammatory cells which are attached to the corneal endothelium they can be seen scattered throughout the cornea or sometimes they are present on the inferior half of the cornea and their size also varies some are small sized some are medium sized and some are large gran uh, granulomatous mutton fat sized kps which we seen uh, have seen on the slide of sympathetic ophthalmia so these are small to medium sized kps and there are here are some signs of uh, iris which can be present in the anterior uveitis and i have not mentioned uh, iris signs in the previous slide of uh, clinical features so the iris can be seen as a dull or muddy colored in case of acute anterior uveitis and there are two type of nodules which can be present on the iris uh, there are copies nodules which are seen on the pupillary margin and other are called busaka's nodule which are seen on the body of iris 
and these are the posterior synechies. These are adhesions between the iris and the anterior lens capsule and because of these adhesions the pupil becomes irregular in shape. This is the cells and flare seen in the anterior chamber and uh, these cells and flare are seen with the help of slit lamp. This is the picture taken with the help of slit lamp. And we adjust two beams of uh, slit lamp uh, on the one on the cornea and other on the iris and the area between in between is the anterior chamber. These are floating particles which are the inflammatory cells and this smoky appearance in which the inflammatory cells are moving are, is called flare. And this is the inflammatory cell in the vitreous, it is called vitritis. And here are the snowball opacities, which are inflammatory clumps, which, are, which can be seen in some cases of intermediate uveitis. This is diffuse vitritis or diffuse vitreous haze. And here are the patches of choroiditis. These are different patches, yellowish white patches of choroiditis uh, which are seen in, which, uh, in the posterior uveitis or in cases of pan uveitis. This is severe macular edema which is seen especially in cases of intermediate uveitis or posterior uveitis or pan uveitis. But macular edema can be seen in anterior uveitis also. This is how we grade the cells and flare in the anterior chamber. For the cells, we count the number of cells if they are countable and grade them from 0 to plus 4. If the cells are less than 5 in number, we, we say that the, there are occasional cells in the anterior chamber. And if the cells are uh, counted as from 6, 6 to 15, uh, it is plus 1. And 16 to 25, grade uh, 2. 26 to 50, grade 3. And if the cells are more than 50, then grade 4. And for the flare, complete absence, 0. And um, plus 1, barely detectable flare. Plus 2, details of uh, iris and uh, lens are clearly visible. And uh, grade 3, the iris and lens details becomes hazy due to this excessive fibrin. And in grade 4 is the intense flare and there is a fixed inflammatory coagulum present in the anterior chamber and forms the, sometimes it forms the inflammatory membranes and occluding the pupil also. For the diagnosis of uveitis, the history and the physical examination is very important to rule out any systemic association. And not every case of acute anterior uveitis needs to be investigated. Like if there is no history of any systemic involvement and there is a single episode of unilateral anterior uveitis only, then we routinely do not do the labs in our practice. But if there is a severe bilateral disease or there is a history of any systemic symptoms like of joint pain and stiffness, in ankylosing spondylitis or abnormal bowel habits, diarrhea or blood in stools in cases of inflammatory bowel diseases or skin changes, changes uh, of uh, psoriasis uh, or if the patient is young child with joint pain and then we advise investigations accordingly or send them to proper consultation to the concerned physician. And also if uh, there are systemic infections are suspected like tuberculosis or syphilis, then they need to be investigated or better to consult with the medical internist to get the proper investigation and treatment. And we routinely investigate uh, all cases of posterior uveitis and pan uveitis. And apart from routine labs, we do the chest x-rays done for the uh, tuberculosis and syphilis and this Montux test for tuberculosis, VDRL for syphilis and IgG and IgM for toxoplasmosis, spinal x-ray uh, in if the ankylosing spondylitis is suspected and uh, to see the bamboo spine 
and some physicians also advise serum angiotensin converting enzymes and serum calcium for the sarcoidosis then the treatment of uveitis there are three principles of uh, treatment of uveitis number one is to control the inflammation to relieve the pain and treat the secondary infections or inflammatory causes first is control inflammation corticosteroids are the main agents used to control the inflammatory activity they are given in the topical drops or ointments in cases of anterior uveitis topical treatment works only for uh, if the disease is limited to anterior uvea and uh, if there is a severe inflammation and then we can also give the subconjunctival injections of steroids if uh, there is involvement of uh, pars plana that is intermediate uveitis or if there is a posterior or pan uveitis then posterior subtenone or intravitreal steroid injections can be uh, also be used uh, especially the triamcinolone can be used for this purpose sometimes systemic steroids uh, are also used like prednisolone or dexamethasone in cases of uh, steroid resistance or if the patient starts developing complications of steroids like peptic ulcer or increased blood pressure then alternatively the immunosuppressive agents like cyclosporine and methotrexate can also be used for pain relief we use cyclopentax like atropine and cyclopentolate they not only relieve uh, pain by reducing the ciliary spasm they also dilate the pupil and breaks the posterior synecdoches and they also stabilize the blood aqueous barrier and reduce the inflammatory exudation and hypopion formation and third principle is to treat the infections so refer uh, the patients to the concerned physician for the proper treatment of Uh, infectious etiologies like tuberculosis and syphilis uveitis if uh, not treated properly or if it becomes chronic then it may lead to certain visual threatening complications like band keratopathy it is a deposition of uh, calcium salts on the cornea in the shape of strip or band this is advanced band keratopathy this is the complicated cataract this is complicated cataract and uveitis can also lead to glaucoma or sometimes very low intraocular pressure which is called ocular hypotony secondary to acute shutdown of ciliary body then is uh, uh, chronic cystoid macular edema this is cystoid macular edema and this is the fractional retinal detachment secondary to which is uh, secondary to traction of inflammatory membranes in the vitreous which pulls the sensory retina and it causes fractional retinal detachment and finally few points to compile the lecture um, anterior uveitis is the most common type of uveitis idiopathic form is the most common cause of anterior uveitis infections are more common in posterior uveitis and pan uveitis sarcoidosis tuberculosis and syphilis can present in any or all locations and corticosteroids are the main agents to treat most of the cases of uveitis thank you very much